Hi everyone, I am Dr. David Proden, and welcome to the Week 5 Fireside Chat for Educational Leadership 655, Pupil Services and Non-Discrimination. Over my shoulder is the leprechaun, indicating that we are approaching the midpoint of this class. Week 5 begins on Monday, February 22nd, and concludes on Sunday, February 28th, 2021. Topics include human trafficking and grooming, disproportionality, and non-native families. Your SWOT assignments have been graded and returned to your gradebook. You will find them in the feedback file section. Course grades were updated through week three, including your SWOT analysis. Here are some common themes across your 15 papers. Staff turnover and needing to match induction to staff turnover. Open enrollment out. Somebody indicated that a neighboring district was offering driver's education in person. That was very appealing for some parents that were making a decision to send their child to that school because it was something not offered in the other school. Not having IEPs that are compliant due to COVID. Somebody noted that an initial evaluation was still in progress in their district. It had been almost a year, but because of people coming in and out, staff going on quarantine, students going on quarantine, uh, limited access to families that was very difficult to have fidelity in the IEP process. We haven't had much guidance from the state or the Fed, uh, very little guidance, in fact. So do the best that you can. Document the contacts that you're making with families, with parents. And when this is all done, we'll have some way that this will have to be remedied at a federal or state level all the way across the country. Uh, for IEP services that have been interrupted due to the pandemic. You noted increasing mental health needs, not only in your students, but also in staff. And how do you match resources to those needs? Some of you indicated that's an opportunity that you could reach out to community partners, maybe through that community health needs assessment and work with them. Also increasing student aggression, especially in younger students. How do you work with that? How do you navigate that with your crisis response team? And also making sure that the same people aren't always activated and pulled away from their jobs in order to participate in that team response. They have jobs to do. And if we're taking our school counselors, our school psychologists away from their job for a few hours a week or more to respond to student behavior, then we're actually creating the, the cycle where the people who would be working with the outside agencies, would be working with the parents and the family, are having less time to do that because they are on these teams. So it's important to think about your nonviolent crisis intervention teams, for example, who is serving on those and that you do rotate people throughout those teams. Many of your schools have professional learning communities and some form of co-instruction that was listed as a strength, so great job. Also, common planning time. You know, common planning time is an opportunity. Maybe you need to have a schedule committee and consider adjusting the schedule, maybe tossing the schedule out altogether and going with something new for either the school or for the district. I've seen districts do that. It's not easy to do it, but sometimes it yields great success for common planning time going from uh, two, you know, two semesters to a trimester approach. But ultimately, a lot of schools still operate on schedules which are 40, 50 years old. And there can be benefits from looking to a schedule which might have a rotating block or some component like that. So common planning time definitely fits in with those PLCs. And finally, too many initiatives. Wow, this was noted on almost everybody's paper. Too many initiatives. We have things going on that have been going on for the last eight years, David. And yeah, so how do, you, how do you do that? How do you manage when what you're doing pretty much is just adding new initiatives? I was at a cabinet retreat when I was at administrators, so with everybody else on the administrative team, and we were discussing how we could make things more fluid for the upcoming school year. And I said, I think we have too many initiatives. <laughs> I think we should have three initiatives. And you know, we have things we always will, will do right as practice, but we have too many initiatives. We're wearing people out. I almost had to hitchhike my way back home after that. Um, that wasn't well received, but 
the reality is, and we know this, that you can't have all of these initiatives going on and devote the time, the energy, and the resources necessary for all of these. It just is not a model for success. So, and if you have two or three initiatives a year that you are able to, to put your energy in to be very focused, you know, after three, four years, you're looking, well, you know, now we have eight to 10 things which we have advanced in the district. That's pretty substantial. But again, I think people get lost in this initiative. And, and the other part is when an initiative last so long it's like we've had this initiative for the last decade no one really knows the start point of that like where's our growth was it from 10 years ago is it from like three years ago and we kind of overhaul it and so yeah initiative overload i understand what you're saying with that and i think as an administrator you're absolutely right in looking at for example your swat as one tool and that's why i said you know take the swat and try to move one opportunity into strength. Or maybe you wanna do two, but you don't move your eight opportunities into strengths all in one year. So the benefit of a SWOT is it's an easy to use tool. People can figure it out very quickly. You can apply it to a number of things, you know, whether it's your counseling department, whether it's PBIS in the district, special education, referrals, whatever you wanna do. Um, but people understand it and once you have an opportunity, your goal is to take that opportunity and flip it to a strength. So you can prioritize your opportunity, say here is the opportunity that this year we want to flip to a strength. And I also think it gets you away from this whole initiative discussion, which we just had, because people are associating initiatives with kind of these never ending projects, right? Um, or I think it can be much more precise with that SWAT. And, and there is some anchoring that goes on with the SWAT. You know, we think binary. We think, oh, it's a strength or it's a weakness. But with a SWAT, it's a strength, a weakness, opportunity, or a threat. So we have some other areas we can look at. If you're already framing something as an opportunity, you're kind of halfway toward a strength, right? You're, you're saying there are good parts of this. There are things that if we put a, more energy into these components that we can get this down the road and it can be a strength. We can flip this into a strength. So it is a psychological framing where it's easier to have discussions about opportunities when you're talking with people than to have discussions with weakness. Um, just think about that in your, in your own daily activities if you're framing things as a weakness or as an opportunity. Now, with that said, a weakness is different than an opportunity in your SWAT. Um, so yeah, strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. But Having that discussion about opportunities, I think, opens the door for um, people to kind of get that energy back after initiative overload. So let's look ahead to week five. I have the Alexandria, Virginia Schools Pupil Services Program Assessments documents. Um, I like those. And one of the reasons is they are very balanced with qualitative data, um, inter interviewing people, interviewing students, and quantitative, the numbers. Um, I, I see too many assessments which are quantitative. Here are the numbers and not the story. So the Alexandria, Virginia document very much is is telling that story that goes along with the numbers. So I, th I think it's a very good model to use if you're when you're doing your DPI five year pupil non discrimination report, um, it, or just if your board ever says, "Hey, let's do an assessment of our pupil services program," which they might do at some point. Um, follow something like that. I recorded a video about child grooming. Uh, that was done um, as a, under a professional uh, contract with a, with a district. That district has made that available for you in this class. So please take um, advantage of th the documents that are posted along with that, the supporting documents for staff. Uh, you have full access to all of those. Um, and thinking about, you know, child grooming, human trafficking, you know, these are areas that typically fall under the oversight of pupil services directors, uh, school counselors, social workers, psychologists, all kind of responsible for being aware and leading professional development and awareness activities in those areas. And we know that these are substantially increasing areas because of social media. Also look at Lodi School District's board policy for ICE agents on campus and specifically their access to students. And ask yourself, you know, what do, you, what do your staff 
perceive as their role in protecting students um, from ICE agents. There are some school districts who have come out with position papers. As a school board, this is our position if ICE comes on campus, that we would not allow them access to students. But I'm not sure of the legal parameters, right, to that. And I asked one teacher a couple of years ago, and she said, I would keep students in my room and lock the door and, you know, barricade the door, wouldn't allow ICE in, or we would drive students to another location. And so I'm just saying you need to be aware of these things because if you're, what your policy state and how your staff interpret this, I think would introduce some liabilities to your district. And so having the, the question of what would be our response if ICE agents did come to our campus? Lodi has a, a well thought out uh, process for that. But also, again, this is a discussion I, I think that hasn't happened in a lot of districts. And I think some people um, are, have different interpretations of, of their discretion to um, be kind of this, this interface between ICE um, or immigration agents and then also uh, students. Also in the week uh, five reflective teaching annotation, the WIAA's uh, Pupil Non-Discrimination Guidelines for Athletics. So read that. Also meet with your athletic director. Understand your school district responsibilities. Um, how does Title IX work? Title IX would be something that you would report out in your people services non-discrimination report. Um, how many activities do you have for, in your school where students can participate that don't have a cut list? Only so many students can be on the varsity basketball team, but you know, if you have a, a video gaming club, that could be endless, right? Anybody could participate in that. So um, understand that. And then also understand your cut criteria and that you have that very objectively noted. So if you are, for example, meeting with um, whoever de determines show choir, um, how do they, you know, if 50 students are going to try out for show choir and there's 25 spots, how do they make those determinations? Um, so that can be something that would be requested, for example, cut criteria to make sure that there was the subjective criteria. People have been trained on understanding this criteria. So when they're making that cut list, that it does have this objective basis. I've seen that um, come to play out in districts where they've said, well, we want to see the objective cut list of how these determinations were made. Um, also, with coming back to the WIA, um, understanding that if you have uh, a student identifying as, as transgender, for example, with the, the WIA guidance statements on that, there are a lot of components of those statements that require documentation to be maintained on the district side and decisions to be made on the district side. Again, this, this will be a discussion that you'll want to have with your athletic director because ultimately this does fall under pupil services and non-discrimination, and you'll prob probably be in the role of the lead non-discrimination officer in your district. Week four, <laughs> shout outs. Yes, shout outs for everybody. Each person gets a shout out and they're gonna be from your SWATs. Here we go. Becca, um, you said strength. You have a push-in counseling model. Awesome. Weakness, kindergarten referrals. Are the is this a true deficit or have they just not learned the skill? So yeah, and I, I think, you know, as as I was pondering that, um, I I encountered something similar to that where and the early childhood teachers and, and kindergarten teachers got together and we wanted to identify what skills are being taught to kids um, in, in birth to three, for example, in, in daycares and things like this and try to standardize some of these things, you know, recognizing letters, you know, phonemes, you know, sounds, things like this, counting. Um, that did help that when we had, you know, a couple of years down the road, we were able to see students come in and had stronger core skill sets. Also reaching out to um, parents who were didn't have their children participating in these things and were coming straight from home into kindergarten. So, but right, it is a question people want to, I think, initially go and, and say, well, let's do an evaluation to make sure. And you're right, there's a question, is it a skill set um, that hasn't, they have, just haven't learned yet? Um, Corey, a strength. 
business-led school to work transition program for students. That is, that is absolutely terrific. You said a threat, cost of hiring teachers and aides. And the cost there is when you have a turnover multiple times during a year, every time you have turnover, you have to advertise. That person comes in, you're investing time in teaching them their job position, right? Somebody has to spend time with them. And then, you know, maybe they're only there for a few months. They turn over, so you have to post and do all this again. So, yeah, it is. That's a big threat because it takes up a lot of time and resources and I think can become very, um, very much of a fatigue factor for human resources. Katie, a strength. Monthly student intervention team meetings and grade level meetings. Absolutely. Yeah, if you want to get people together, at least on a monthly basis, you know, face to face or Zoom, whatever it is. Uh, so they can they can touch base, especially the student intervention team meetings. If there's something that needs to be uh, addressed with a, a student or get a, a student kind of on a, a watch list early on, very good. Opportunity, school wide training on medical needs of students. Yeah, because um, you know should a custodian be trained in how to administer an EpiPen? Um, should staff be trained on use of an AED, for example, or signs of, of a diabetic uh, shock or something like that. You know, it, it makes sense, I think, to train as many people as you can in these types of things. Um, so yeah, definitely school-wide training. Lindsay, strength, universal design for learning. Yeah, and to me, that's a non-negotiable. I shared the story in School of of, of Airs or went along with School of Airs where we we had a, a vendor come down um, with a phone and, and was saying, here's apps for school safety, for example. And one of the high school students was trying to get the app to work and said, well, I can't, I, this app isn't functioning for me. And the vendor quickly took it, made some adjustments, gave it back and said, well, now the text is larger, so it'll be all right. And she said, well, I'm blind. Is there voice overlay, universal design for learning is, is built with a voice overlay to it? And it didn't. But universal design for learning, right? Uh, are things accessible to students with language barriers? Um, can we make our, you know, anything that's graphically presented so it is either large enough for somebody to see if they have visual deficits or in other mediums if they're, if, you know, they don't have sight or FM systems for auditory or just looking, looking at all of our all of our instruction from that UDL lens. Everything that we do, it makes sense. So thanks, Lindsay. A weakness, buildings get equivalent services, not necessarily needs base. Right, so that usually is district office saying, okay, every building, if you're about the same size, whatever it is, you're going to get this amount of services. Even though it's like this building um, has students with a significant different profile of needs. Um, and they should probably be receiving a different set of services or more services and this other building should be receiving less. So, yeah. Hillary, opportunities, new staff mentoring. Um, and I, I agree, it's actually the number one factor in people not resigning if they have a mentor and someone that they can go to or if they find like one friend at work, that is like the number one factor in people not resigning after, after the first year. So definitely, um, you also said a threat is that you don't have a district social worker. And yeah, in these days, I, I think you, you need to, right? I, I, I just think there's so much um, that happens between family and school. Um, also, school nurse, social workers is very important. School nurse now is even more important with, uh, with COVID management. Um, different COVID protocols, right? And some schools contract, what, you know, a, a day a week of nurse time. Uh, beyond that, right? I mean, if we look at, at, at students with uh, type one, you know, diabetes and different medical needs profiles of, of kids, boy, our nurse ratios across the country are really, really low right now. Sometimes one nurse to a thousand students. So as you mentioned, social worker, I'll add to that, um, not having a, enough nurses in schools is a threat. Melissa, a strength, ability to work with local media to promote school district. And I like that. I like that. Um, having some, you know, making that invitation to the media, hey, come in, we have these activities going on or sharing some things with the media. Um, and 
that is also a good way, um, how should I say, I, I don't want to make it sound like you have to market your, your district in an open enrollment environment, but I think to make people aware of the great things that are happening across districts. So um, yeah, work with your work with your local media. And often, um, you know, they'll, they'll take you up on that. I mean, they, they want that because who's reading the media, right? It's, it's usually the, or the newspapers and things like that and seeing the stories. It's the parents. Um, threat. Too much in-house professional development leads to few highly trained people. So, yeah, it's a great point. Um, you say, well, this is our person who is like our autism expert. So we're going to send them to these trainings and they're going to kind of lead things. And this is our person in literacy and this is our person in behavior. And, and you're like, okay, those people really have deep skill sets now. But yeah, we don't kind of have that balanced out across other people. So it's finding those internal experts, but not then just saying, you know, we're going to have those internal experts are going to be our go-to people. We have to build capacity around them. Lauren, an opportunity, assigning team heads, such as a school psychologist, kind of here's our head of school psychology. And that person would ensure that, for example, um, test protocols are, you're ordering the most current test protocols, or they're keeping track of the new assessments that are out there and bringing them to the different, you know, psychologists or meeting and saying, you know, what do we want to go with? Let's look at assessments. I'm keeping track of this. So I think it is a way to definitely make sure that you have um, vertical alignment, right? That someone is that lead of a department, especially when you're in a bigger district, and then horizontal psychologists or whether it be speech language pathologists across the different buildings that there's some consistency that, or that there is there is consistency, especially in ordering materials and understanding what is out there for for new materials. Um, and sometimes it's not even that. It's it's like we somebody ordered this, and <laughs> I wasn't even aware this was in the district. And you know, so could we borrow this across buildings? You indicated a threat. Uh, you said some groups um, have the feeling that there is no clear direction, and I think that comes maybe from kind of like the initiative overload um, and. Once that happens, once people are like, well, I'm on this group, but like, I'm not sure exactly what we're supposed to accomplish or what we've accomplished since it started. And so where do we go? Um, that leads to fatigue. I mean, people just don't keep the energy up and things like that. You know, we can't have these perpetual projects where people kind of come in and out and in and out. There needs to be a start point and an end point. And so, yeah, Ashley, a strength trained health assistants at the buildings supervised by a registered nurse. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a strength. And again, you know, buildings, we think of students um, who have different array of medical needs. We do know that we have more students with allergies, type 1 diabetes, for example. But to have your RN being the one that's training and overseeing those health assistants, absolutely. That is a strength. Weakness. Limited staff to respond to extreme student behaviors. Yeah, you're right. Um, and what if staff opt out, say, physically, I can't participate in a hold, for example, um, one of the NVCI holds. I can be a person that comes in and documents, but I, I can't do this. Um, so who are the people who are serving on your team? Are you rotating those people out? And then also a big question comes in of, of when those people are responding to the team, um, how do they make up? The work that they had to leave, especially if it's a counselor or a school psychologist who then, you know, might have additional work because of this, meaning that they are going to then need to be contacting outside providers, following up, maybe doing additional assessments, um, working on behavior intervention plans, um, things like that. So I, I knew a, a district where uh, School, psych, uh, school psychologist came in and met with the director and said, um, I'm going to need to resign um, because I'm having 10 hours of my time each week. I'm being called to NVCI um, incidents and I'm a member of the team. So, right, um, you know, you these things can take, take a long time um, sometimes for the student to deescalate, then it's debriefing afterwards, documentation. And, and she said, I'm just so far behind on what I need to be doing. And it's this, this circle, this vicious circle then where uh, I can't provide the services that benefit the students who have these um, 
incidents because I, you know, am, am on this team. So um, the the principal and the director then did remove that person from the team. But you know, it's difficult. You only have so many people, especially in a smaller school, and right, you absolutely need your nonviolent crisis intervention team to be able to respond. Marlene. You wrote as a strength, Parent Advisory Committee for Special Education in 504s. Yeah, having parents involved in, as you said, advisory. We talked about that at the beginning of class. Weakness, multi-year disproportionality. And my question to that is, um, what will break the cycle? So uh, there are some districts in the state who have been identified disproportionate for a number of years, you know, beyond 10 years consecutive. The state used to have a very, I thought, well thought out um, Create, a, uh, create conference, culturally responsive education conference. I don't think it's as strong as it was um, when I participated in it, for example, like 15, 20 years ago. But yeah, at some point, either also the, the state or the feds can come in and say, you need to go with a, a more aggressive plan to address disproportionality. They can say, we're going to take part of your flow through dollars. And now they have to be Allocate it only toward disproportionality um, but remediation efforts. So suddenly your flow through budget changes by a percentage. I had that happen once when I was a director. Um, so yeah, multi-year disproportionality. And I think ultimately a question comes in. I mean, if you're seven, eight years into something like that, what is it going to take to disrupt that? And it might be some pretty substantial steps, right? So that's the question you have to ask as a special education director and you know uh, what is what is going to what is going to shake this up um, Chris a strength task analysis approach breaking things into component tasks um, that's thoughtful I, I I was as I read that I'm like yeah you know we we tend to approach things at this macro level like here's this this big task or big assignment and you're saying you know strength of our district is we, we tend to be very task analysis oriented, you know, breaking things down and saying, we'll do all these pieces. It'll then add to the composite, get our, get the whole. Um, it's also really good for writing IEP goals, right? Like we're going to do these composites, which, which will reach to this ultimate goal. It's a good way to show growth. A weakness, you said, you know, teaching in isolation, especially what that looks like during COVID. Michelle, strength, employee wellness program. Absolutely, absolutely. And in 2015, the Army created an Army civilian program for civilians working with the Army and enrolled them into this employee wellness program. Again, because fitness, nutrition, mental health um, all plays a significant part to people being um, happier, people being more productive at work, of just having a better work-life balance. So employee wellness programs as a strength Threat high mental health needs with students and staff. Yes, and that will only increase, I think, with COVID and this kind of toggling of services on and off. It's a lot of stress for people right now. Kelly, strength. Co-planning, absolutely. Anytime you can have co-planning, that is a strength. Regular education and special education teacher, if you can bring in common planning time with that, an additional strength. You mentioned for stakeholders. Uh, food service. And I'm like, yeah, food service, absolutely, because food service, uh, needing to understand allergy management, how food service is, is handling cross-contamination, how food service might be ordering. So you're not changing your applesauce mid-year into something else from a different company without taking that into consideration for carb counts and things like that for, for student special diets. And I say, you know, like custodians, also stakeholders, uh, making sure that access to the facilities, access to the playgrounds, um, and custodians understanding cross-contamination as they uh, clean the, the buildings. J, a strength, efficient bus transportation pickup and drop-off times. Yeah, it's one of those things we don't think about a lot, but if you have that very efficient, uh, students are spending less time on the, the bus right? And more time in schools. So it's a plus on both sides. So very efficient bus transportation pickup and drop off times. A weakness, you have council ratio 310 to one. So yeah, and, and that's something where 
it's a benefit to do comparisons with neighboring districts, maybe in your conference and find out what their ratios are at different levels and present that to your superintendent and to your board meeting so you understand where your staffing is within that. Um, I, I've done that, I mean, on a pretty regular basis, uh, school boards would ask, you know, how do, how do we compare to the neighboring districts for, you know, counseling or whatever? Um, and if, if you're not aware of that, definitely go ahead and, and do that. I think that's also something that annually can be done and presented to a school board. Nick, a strength. All staff are CPI certified. Opportunity. Somebody um, built a house or was going to build a house for 18 to 21-year-olds for transition skills, a kitchenette in the middle school area for students with intellectual disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And those are really thoughtful things. And for example, you can take Medicaid reimbursement money that comes back to the district, maybe allocate it into doing something like that. Um, more schools tend to do do this. And I think it's, it's a win-win all the way around. Um, and we also talked about the Taurus, the bagel last week, right? So maybe have where you come into the this 18, you know, this this house and something's not right. You know, the power won't go on. So like then, you know, lights won't turn on. What do you have to do? Or there's a leaky faucet. So how would you problem solve that? When I worked at the Wisconsin School for the Blind, they had something called the Life House, L-I-F-E House, Life House. And it was a block away from campus and it was a house, um, a ranch house. And students would live there with uh, with an adult um, for about a month and this was in their last year so these are all you know high school age students and they would have to do all of their shopping cooking figure out what they were gonna have on the tv or radio um you know clean up and stuff like that but that was that experience of, of trying to get them closer to what it would be when they exit um the e exit the school so that was, that was really well done. And I think, again, kudos to your school for doing that. And Michael, strength, assistive technology leadership team is in the district. Yeah, assistive technology can be kind of nebulous. Um, things change a lot. So if you have a team in district, that's a huge plus. You said an opportunity is restorative justice. Yeah, restorative justice is very effective. It's also very time consuming. So it needs to be this full buy-in for people to do restorative justice. But yeah, restorative justice um, has been shown to decrease you know, recidivism in students. Um, it, it benefits students with disabilities, students without disabilities um, for disproportionality. It's a plus, so there are a lot of areas, but again, restorative justice has to be something that everybody kind of immerses in and has full buy-in. So that is it. This was well worth the individual shout outs. Uh, you did a terrific, job. I've said that a wonderful, fabulous job on the SWATs. So again, welcome to week five, and we are approaching this midpoint of the class.